save you guys the save that. All right. Um, thanks, Clark and Tyler, for for inviting me to talk about this big year, and um, and Julie for setting this all up. And it was quite easy to get on here with uh, with the Zoom and everything. Um, Hate doing these things on Zoom, but you know it is what it is right now. We'll make the best of it. Um, hopefully, we'll we'll have plenty of time for some questions at the end. There's like so much to cover of like why I'm doing this and how I got into doing this and like bird stories. There's more bird stories than um, I can tell in 45 minutes or so. I'll throw in a little bit about some of the work that I do with Fish and Wildlife Service. Just kind of mix it up a little bit, um, and. Uh, Try to cover what we can and, and the limited amount of time that we've got. But now you're not going to change screen, huh? Change slides. There we go. So, um, what is green birding? So this is like sort of the one of the. I got to move some of these things off the screen here. Um, Basically, green bring my definition is walking or riding my bike from my house and back. So not driving, fully limited to moving from my house on my own power. Um, it's kind of crazy. I get it. But I mean, uh, um, you know, you can do this like I, I live right next to Clement Park, which is just nothing special. There's not even really a good patch of woods, Prairie Dog Town, a little reservoir. Um, and I walked him and I can be there in, in two and a half minutes or three minutes. And last week I got a rough legged hawk for 177 species at that little place. I mean, it's just um, part of the green thing is not just like riding your bike somewhere, but um, walking, doing something local and just like repeatedly hitting the same patches. Like I love going to Clement Park. It is unassuming. It is not very interesting, but I keep finding good stuff there over the last couple of years. I've really like, you know, it's just been, it's just been so much fun. Um, but I mean, you can kind of take the green birding thing to an extreme, which is kind of what I've done this year with, with riding far, but you don't have to do that kind of thing. And, um, you know, there's one thing that I've learned a lot is that there's, there's so much open space. There's so many little parks and patches that nobody really goes to, or I wasn't even aware of that. Um, I've discovered through like a getting out on my bike and hitting the bike paths and just kind of exploring a lot. It's been, it's so much fun. And, um, you know, I'm not driving all over the place and I really just love local birding. It's really changed how I, I go birding and I do it every day. I mean, I'm doing something, whether it's in my yard, talking about Harris's spire being rare. I've had Harris's spire again this morning. I've had, sometimes I've had two for the last two weeks. I've had one or two almost every day. It's pretty, pretty good yard bird, um, at least for Jefferson County up here. So what is the green big year? To find as many species as possible in a calendar year. So 2021 is the year I'm punishing myself trying to do this. Um, like I said, it's I'm walking from my house, which is basically my park um, or the playground. Sometimes weird things fly by. I'm birding from the yard um, and then riding my bike wherever I can physically get myself to and back. It's also extremely crazy as I already knew, but it's really, really nuts because between working full time, having our, our I don't know if you can see my cursor. The boys are just turned five, like I said, and then Jill is nine. Um, it is nonstop. And then I just like crash every night because I'm so exhausted. So how did this all come to be? Because um, we've got, we started the new Jill Roller Memorial, Memorial Grant. So most, most folks in the birding community at least know Joe's name from uh, the Coburn's Listserv or other places. And, um, you know, I got to know Joe pretty quickly after moving here and the very first DFO trip I went on, I saw John Drummond was on here. I met John, I met Joe and Jerry, Joey Kellner and some other folks. Um, I got swindled into being an eBird reviewer that day because Joe was like, come on, you could do it. You could do it. I mean, you'd be great at it. Um, everybody's got a Joe story. And he was just one of those guys that you, you, you just came to like, you know, there was just one of these, um, it was just one of those people that you just clicked with and you looked up to and he was sort of like that adopted grandfather. I guess he's it was the same age as my father. Um, there's somebody you looked up to and admired. And I mean, he told terrible jokes, but they were awesome. And I loved just emailing with them or burning with them. And he was, it was just somebody you looked up to. And um, he passed away the day before Thanksgiving last year. And I was already green birding last year a lot since we were all stuck at home. Um, and I was thought about what I could do. And I talked to Colorado field ornithologists and Denver field ornithologists and kind of came up with the research grant idea. 
Um, and then we very quickly established the, the Joe Baller Memorial Grant and basically decided to try to fund this through pledges per species or just flat donations um, with the goal of trying to get 250 species. And so the, the, this goes into the conservation grant research grants. And so it's like 500 to $1,500 grants typically. Um, you know, when I was a poor graduate student in Georgia, you know, I got a $1,500 grant from Georgia Ornithological Society that paid for my mileage and it, that helped me get the project done. And it was so important. So it feels like I'm promoting something good and green and local, um, doing something for Joe and honoring Joe and um, putting forward, you know, paying it forward to the next, you know, generations of ornithologists. And it all came together like really fast because this happened from Thanksgiving to January 1, I was out chasing birds. Um, so a little bit of the backstory, like I said, I'd started riding again in, in 2020. In late March, I chased some sagebrush sparrows that were not too far away. And I was like, eh, I mean, I just threw my binoculars in the back of my jersey and went and it was only like eight or nine miles, no big deal. And um, I've done some big days in the past and um, green big days with when I lived in Nashville and I've, I've done a couple here as well. And I mean, I always emailed with Joe about it. He was like, I can't believe you went and saw that or you got found this bird on your bike. That's crazy. And he totally kind of teased me about it, but he always kept encouraging me to, encouraging me to do it. And then it really got kind of crazy. Last fall, I chased uh, a friend of mine, found a vermilion flycatcher at Chatfield State Park, which you'll come to find out I'm there like all the time. I was there today. And on my way, I flushed a thick-billed long spur, and then I found a Lapland long spur, and I got the vermilion flycatcher in about 20 minutes, which is just ridiculous. And it never got above 30 degrees that day. Um, just, it got a little nutty. Um, but last year, I ended with 244 species, which isn't bad, considering I started in late March, and I was just, you know, kind of figuring out how to do all this. Um, although I'd been green birding a little bit, um, a little bit of inspiration certainly came from Thomas Heinrich, who lives up in Boulder. And last year, he got 281 species um, based out of his house. Yeah, a little bit better access to the mountains and all, but we we email back and forth and text about birds, and he's still out chasing birds trying to catch me. He's I think he's probably got 255 for the year. Or so um, it's all all good fun and encouraging each other to to go after birds and uh, keep exercising. So. Um, CFO took this on very quickly. Uh, uh, Nick Kumar is on here who helped make all this happen. We've got a web page where you can do the donations or pledges. And just like the response has been unbelievable. The, you know, I really did not expect the pledges and donations to come in as, as, they, as they have. It's, um, I don't know what else to say, but thank you. I mean, it's uh, absolutely unbelievable. I think we're gonna be raising over $30,000 to this. I thought, originally I thought maybe 7,500 or maybe, $10,000 would be like a high end. And it's just, it's gotten amazing. It's just unbelievable. I, I just can't believe it. It's very inspiring for sure. Um, I do have a blog and I'll put up the link to the blog. You know, which is like Google Joe Dollar Memorial Green Big Year and it'll come up with it. I have so many stories I have not written up that are still stuck in my head. I just have not had time to write them all down. Um, but I, I've been trying to capture some stuff on there and I'll, I'll hopefully be fleshing some more of that stuff out as, as I get some time. But at least it's nice to capture some of the stories and sort of like where I am and what I've done and um, some of the fun adventures of the year. So one of the big things is, you know, what is your strategy? Like, how do you, how do, you do this? I mean, yeah, you have to chase birds when you can. Um, I need to find my own birds. You, know, you just got to go out a lot. And I'm like, I'll get to telling about what happened today. Um, you just got to go out and find your own birds. But I also have to be really strategic. I can't just go riding all over the place because I have to worry about childcare. I have to work. I've got all those things going on. Uh, my bikes are old. I'm getting old. I got to try to keep everything functioning. Um, I get so many eBird alerts. I can't wait to turn them off on January 1st because I do not care that I still do not have Pygmy Nuthatch in Douglas County, but I get the Douglas County hourly needs list um, because chat, half the chat fields in Douglas County. Um, and also, you know, having a species list and organizing it to know what you've gotten, what I still need to get. And so what I've done, I mean, I basically came up with a list of everything that could possibly show up that I could potentially find. Um, and I gave them all codes, like one is birds that I'll just get without trying. And there are about 140 of those, like house finch, house sparrow, song sparrow, ring billed gull, stuff like that. Um, all the way up to the code five, which are, you know, super rare that I'd have to chase or really good ones that I end up finding on my own somehow or another. And then I've got a column where I, I mark them off when I've gotten them. And I have a little bit of a strategy, like, where am I, where am I going to get such and such? Make sure I get um, the different species. And it kind of helps make you, makes me keep up with what I've gotten, what I need to make sure I get. 
and, and kind of keep me keep me focused on you know this is this a little old I've, I've checked off snow goose sandhill crane finally and pacific loon um, but you need to have some sort of strategy and to organize yourself so come january 1st it was 24 degrees I sent out on my bike um being the crazy person that i am to go get the white wing crossbill that was in lakewood for four or five days and fortunately it lingered for a couple couple days into the new year um, I took off at sunrise and it was cold. It was really cold. I mean, I've got warm cycling gear, but it was really cold. And I get there and I end up like having to walk up this street because it was covered in ice. And when I'm on my road bike, I mean, I'm going to end up hitting the ground. And I get to the intersection where you can kind of watch the house and the feeder and not be like kind of creepy in somebody's front yard. And there's nobody there. I'm like, why is there nobody here? Like, you know, you'd think some of the locals would be here looking for the white wing cross bill on day one. Uh, nobody was there. Somebody had just left and said, oh, it flew away about 15 minutes ago. But I hung out for about 10 minutes. And luckily, it came in as a terrible phone through binoculars photo of the bird. Um, it was actually a life bird for me a few days earlier. So I was thrilled to get that. And I picked up the Barrow's Golden Eye that, you know, I wanted to kind of hurry and make sure I got that. And it spent like the next three months on the river in the South Platte in Denver. Um, really nice to kind of check off some of those birds. I missed... Uh, Rusty blackbird, long-tailed duck that day, but I still had 51 species on the first day of the year, which was which was pretty awesome. And then I went out and got the long-tailed and the rusty the next day. It was really kind of nice to get some of those birds checked off um, and log way too many miles in the first couple of days of the year. But then that night, I was already having some little spots on my head that were bothering me, and I got the shingles, and it was so awful. And that's where I spent a few days. Uh, and nights rocking, holding my head, trying to not cry because my head hurt so bad while I was waiting for the pain meds to kick in. And I was down for a good 10 days. I, I, I went for a walk. I tried to go find Eastern bluebirds that I knew were around and I barely made it home. I was like, I should have just stayed home. Um, I'm stubborn. But I got over it. And of course, there were red poles. There was a red pole at Chatfield and a golden crown sparrow and um, a lot of stuff. And I was like, I can't even like walk up the street at this point. It was it was agony. And I'm still like, I finally gotten off the pain meds. But, you know, when I had it on my the side of my left side of my scalp and my scalp still feels like the Novocaine is wearing off kind of thing because it's a nervous system issue. It was terrible. And it's, we're going on nearly a year of having the nervous the nerve pain. It stinks get your vaccine if you haven't gotten the shingles vaccine. But late in the month, I was feeling better. I'd been getting, I got out and gotten the golden crown sparrow that was down at Chatfield. And I took, you know, I hadn't really been doing big rides when I took off for golden to try to get the rosy finches that were coming to um, private residence up there. But, you know, very, all the locals have, have seen the birds there. I took off and it was cold and it got warm really fast. And I'm like, they don't come in when it's warm. And I show up and Kirsten was like, Oh, they were here a couple of times. They'll be back. And we chatted and I waited about 30 minutes. I'm sitting there sweating in my second gear, taking off layers. And I'll be darned. They all showed this like swarm of two or 300 birds came in and I managed to get all three species, which was awesome. And it was, it was just one of those magical moments. You're just sitting there just under surrounded by rosy finches and knowing that I am probably not going to ride all the way back up here, 25 miles or more to, to try to get these birds, but uh, being able to get them and, and, uh, hospitality was awesome and she let me fill up my water bottles and <laughs> gave me tea and everything it was great um you know that's just kind of part of it is yes it's getting the birds but it's also having fun and getting to meet people i hadn't met her before and it was awesome I and mean, it was a really really great experience and then, um you know on my way home i picked up icing gull there was a brown thrasher which was in golden at a private residence and i sat down and figured oh i'm gonna have to sit in here and wait for lunch for a while and i mean the bird showed up within like a minute and i was like well i guess i'll hang out and eat my lunch anyway um Really, I mean, it was just really dry and, and warm for late January. I actually do stop and like look around the scenery sometimes. I, I often will forget to do that, especially on new paths. But, um, you know, that's part of the fun of this is just exploring new places and uh, meeting new people and seeing birds and having a good time while you're out there. So I call this the, the Glaucus Gull Saga. <laughs> I mean, this is, you know, a code for probably on my list. Like I need to kind of work for it. I kind of got to make sure I go get one if I'm going to get one. And one was reported at a park about four miles from my house the day before on the 21st. And I was like, ah, man, like they're really hard to find in Jefferson County. Like they just don't show up. And then a photo appeared and like, oh man, it really is legit. And, um, and then it was there the next morning. I was like, there's no way it's going to be there the next day. And it was and like, I had, I can't remember exactly the situation. I had no childcare that day. Maybe, I don't, maybe when Annie was sick, I can't remember. And I was texting with friends like the birds there like 
And so uh, a couple of our, my friends who have since moved to Louisiana said, well, well, I can drop off Claire and she can watch the boys. Like, can you get them lunch and we can hang out outside? Cause you know, we're in the midst of a pandemic and we're all trying to be careful and, and take care of each other. And um, she dropped off or Tom dropped off Claire and I would like took off on my bike and Tom like drove to the park and had the birds staked out, but it was so windy. And I had I literally rode uphill the whole way. I mean, it's not like steep, but it's like slightly uphill the whole way. And it was a terrible headwind. And I get there, I'm breathing just like my heart's in my throat. I'm like just suffering. And I get there and I see the bird and take a couple of terrible digibin photos of it. And Tom and, and Rob Breaker and a couple other folks were 50 yards away. They didn't even see me. I didn't even know I was there because it was so windy and they were focused on the bird. And this is just, you know, the luck. I mean, I saw the bird four minutes later, a bald eagle comes in, flushes everything. The bird flew over my head and like Tom and Rob got these photos um, while it was like flying over our heads and it was never seen again. And I managed to get home. The whole trip took 46 minutes and I got a really good bird. I really owed uh, Tom and Claire for uh, helping me out. I mean, it's a team effort to, to get birds sometimes. It was really, really just a crazy, <laughs> really crazy fun um, hour to make that all happen. So this all sort of like came full cycle when I saw a Eber post from Greg Goodrich about a sagebrush sparrow at, at Chatfield, of course. Um, I thought, oh gosh, I got to get that. You know, this is, and it was like the, the 25th of March is I think when I got it in 2020. So the timing was perfect. And it d described exactly where the bird was. I didn't have his phone number. I didn't know how to reach him to like find out exactly where the bird was and everything. The Z-Bird report was pretty good. I texted a couple of folks and they actually beat me there, but I got there in really good time. And we found the bird and um, after about 10 minutes of looking and it, it just came out, it was super cooperative. And it just I kind of like, you know, this whole thing started with sagebrush sparrow and then it kind of came back to, I mean, I already had 111 species by the end of, by the 26th of March. Um, and bringing it back to sagebrush sparrow was, was really cool. Plus they're just like spectacular, gorgeous birds. So one thing I've been asked is like, how do you carry your stuff? like? What all do you take when you ride? So I've got my old road bike here. Like I used to race road bikes back in the mid 2000s and um, poorly, but I did race. And this frame's got 27, 28,000 miles on it now. So it's super creaky and, and everything, but it's getting me around. And I basically just got a Camelback backpack. I've got, it doesn't show it very well here, but I've got a little tiny fold up tripod and I throw my scope in the backpack and binoculars and Sometimes I've got uh, like flip flops if I'm going to be walking around a lot. I've got mountain bike shoes. So I can walk around pretty good versus road cycling shoes. Um, I can pretty much carry what I need with me for, for most of the day. Um, unfortunately, I've actually not had to stop at a gas station or anything and get water this year. Kind of like having friends meet me at places and bring me, bring me water or whatever. I think getting to bird with folks has been uh, really made it a lot of fun and uh, helps, keep me, helps keep me going while I'm out there. And sort of my backup bike, this is a cyclocross bike, sort of a gravel bike. And I'll put my heavy tripod on there when I need to, or when, you know, if I'm doing lots of riding on gravel, I'll take this old heavy beast out. Um, so I can, I can get, you know, I can get my gear out there pretty well. It's not always easy. It's not light by any means, but I, but I can make it happen. And I've got a couple, a couple options for old bikes to keep me moving. So one of the most ridiculous, crazy stories of the year was, the shorty dial that was at Bear Creek Lake Park up here in Jefferson County for about an hour. And I saw an eBird report for a burrowing owl. I was like, man, I really got to go get a burrowing owl. Like I'm, I might be able to find one at Chatfield, which I did like a week later, we got one. Um, I was like, man, I really got to go after this bird. I've got literally a two hour window. I mean, it came through at like 10 o'clock, 1030, 1045. I have a call at one that I absolutely have to be on. And I can be at Bear Creek Lake Park. You can be this spot in about 30 minutes especially if I'm working hard. And so I, I was like, I got to go. Like, we're going to, I got to talk to a few friends. They're like, we'll meet you over there. We'll, we'll find this bird. And as soon as I, I'm in the garage, like putting on my helmet, I get a report that it's a shorter owl, not a burrowing. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. A shorter your owl's over there. Like we got to get on it. Cause there was, there was a big fire here. Gosh, when was that back in the fall, I guess. And so there's ton of um, really nice, you know, really short grass where ideally that's where the bird was hanging out. But um, so I took off and like even more motivation, try to get this because I've still not hadn't seen a shorter down in the state that would even be a state bird for me. And so I take off and I'm pedaling and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm huffing it there and I take a drink out of my water bottle and it's frozen. 
turns out the boys, one of the boys turned our little freezer fridge in the garage to the coldest setting. And so everything was frozen. I had one water bottle that wasn't frozen and one was completely frozen. Um, and as I'm on my way there, like I was already having some shifting issues on my, the shifter for my cassette in the back broke. And I was stuck in, essentially I could change from the big ring to the small ring in the front of the bike. Um, I could adjust up here, but I couldn't change gears in the back. And so I was basically stuck in the smallest gear, which was good for going uphill, but not for going downhill and going fast. Cause like, I just, I, you can't pedal fast enough. So I, like frozen water bottle, broken bike. I get there. There's not even an, there's no one there. I don't even like, I couldn't find anybody. And I, Myron um, here in the green shows up and he's like, I don't know where the bird is. And I get a call from Rob Raker. He, he had the bird. And I was like, that's you up the hill. And so like, for some dumb reason, I stopped in the middle of the dam all halfway up the hill. It's like 6%. I don't know why I stopped there. Um, so I had to get going again and get up to the top of the hill and go down this dirt road. And there's a big sign that says no hikers, no bikers. And there's a bunch of people working there. I just went right on past. It didn't even really matter at that point. I was like, I've got to get, try to get down there before the bird flies. And we see it from, I don't know, a good three quarters of a mile away. And there's no question what it was. We, it was awesome. Rob, Rob let, me, uh, lent me this photo that he had before the bird moved further away. Um, and this was a picture of me because I had basically like dropped the bike and ran across the field to try to get home the bird before it was gone. And I dropped my chain. So it was like just a series of, of follies as I was, um, trying to get to Bear Creek and get back. And I got home at like 12.57. I literally plopped down in front of the, the computer with the camera off and in my cycling gear, trying to stretch, catch my breath. Didn't need to participate. I just needed to be on that call. Um, and I made it and we got the bird and it was absolutely incredible. And I don't know, apparently Myron is not susceptible to cold because I had all my warm gear on and Rob is decked out in all of his layers of winter hat and, Rob, and Myron just like, I don't need a hat. I don't need a jacket. We're good. We're good. It was just one of our uh, few ridiculous, silly selfies that we took this year, but quite a, quite a, the adventure. And of course, then I had to put that bike in the shop for a while until we get parts. And of course there's a part, you know, everything's backed up with getting bikes and parts. And also I was on a backup bike for quite a, quite a while. Um, that was another story for another day. So one of the many times I've been to Chatfield this year um, was the chase of Marble Godwit, which was, which Myron had found the morning of the 17th. And of course I'm on my backup bike and, you know, shorebirds are tough. Like, you know, the, my strategy was not to go chasing everything because I can't just chase everything, but go after the big shorebirds, go after Godwits, go after curlews. Um, you know, if a Wimbrel shows up, which amazingly we had a couple around, I managed to get one of those, but go after them. Likely I'll get leased and semis and bairds and um, a lot of the other shorebirds along the way. So I got down there and we eventually got, eventually found the, the Godwit had been moving around, but it was back at the sand spit. And um, I hadn't even like seen Meyer and we were like texting and talking to each other, trying to figure out where birds were. And um, I had been driving, riding just, I mean, I've got the Godwit. I was pretty pleased just to get Marble Godwit and check that one off. Cause they're, you know, they're just awesome birds and really nice to get, get that one for the year. I was riding through Plum Creek and Sage Slashers had just returned and there were a few singing and so I just stopped for literally just no reason, but to just, it's quiet, it's cold, there's nobody at Chatfield, it's awesome. Sage Slashers are singing, it was just kind of lovely. And here comes Myron driving, driving down the road and he stopped and we got out and we we're just chatting about the Godwit and we're just standing there like, what is that call? What is that? And it was like the parrot, this two note call, it could not, didn't, nothing, it didn't trigger anything in my head. And then I saw it and there was a curlew flying by and he managed to get a couple photos of it as it was blowing by. And of course we had all kinds of high fives, like, man, that was a big time, you know, green big year pickup. Like I can't just go out and get a curl of it. it just doesn't happen on the bike very easily. So it was, you know, this is just the kind of luck that's happened this year. Like I stopped for no reason just to, just to listen to stage thrashers. I guess that was a really good reason. Just stand there for no reason other than that. Um, and had actually been checking the Prairie Dog Town for curlews. And then the curlew comes flying by. I mean, it was just, it was just awesome. Like, so many fun, fun days like this throughout the year. I don't think I'm just pedaling around <laughs> on my bike to get, to get all these birds. So like 12 weeks, 12 days later, I'm back at Chatfield. <clears throat> Literally no reason to go back to Chatfield other than the water was low. The mud flats were good in Plum Creek. I'll go down there and see what I can find. Like, you know, you, one of the strategies, you just gotta, you just gotta go out and find your own birds. And 
Um, a friend of mine said he had a bunch of white-faced ibis on the sand spit right at, right at sunrise. And of course I get there and there's no birds. Um, and white-faced ibis is, that should probably be on my fairly rare list. Like they're around, but they don't stick. I don't see them very often. Even if I'm driving all over the place, I don't find them very frequently. Um, I've probably only seen them in Jefferson County once or, or twice of that. Like I just don't come across them. And um, I was out there, I think I ended up getting 11 species of shorebird this day and kind of checked, I got all the peeps and I mean, it was, it was pretty awesome. And um, I'm standing out there. I didn't even see Myron taking this photo. I didn't even know he was there. He was on the other side of the inlet and the white-faced ibis flew in. I mean, it looks like I'm really close. I was probably easily a hundred yards from the birds. They preened and dozed and they flew off on their own. It was like, I never saw another white-faced ibis, ibis the rest of the year. And I just got insanely lucky. Those birds, just, I don't know where they came from, out of the Plum Creek Delta in the, from the woods and the wetlands in there somewhere. It popped out and just um, made my day. And it was just one of those times, you know, you just make a decision. The lighting is good. The water levels are good. Let's just go see what's out there. And I mean, I, it was just awesome. It was just so much fun. Just kind of the luck you need getting out there. But my spring shorebird strategy is I've been calling it really paid off. Because I got nearly all the expected shorebirds in the spring, including the Wimbrel. Um, I missed Sanderling, which I've since gotten a couple times, but Tadfield's usually fairly low this time of year and it is high. There's been no mud flats this whole fall. There's very little shorebird shoreline at all. It's been fairly disappointing from that standpoint, um, just because it's like, I don't think it's ever been, it hasn't been this high in, in October and in November and, you know, a couple of decades. I don't know what the management objective is or whatnot, but. Um, it's made it hard to get some more bird, other other birds to, to drop in and hang out for a while because we don't have that those big roosting areas right now, loafing areas. So more Chatfield. Um, just another one of these days where, you know, well, again, Myron found the palm warbler. I said, man, I really don't want to chase the palm warbler. I'll get more chances the palm warblers, but I really need to, I really need to try to get it. You just sometimes you just gotta go after birds when you get a chance to go after them. And um, I met Met Joey Kellner down there, who knows every little nook and cranny of the whole Chatfield area. And um, we'd basically given up looking for the palm warbler, and we had started turning. We turned back on the path along this reservoir, a uh, little reservoir nearby, and there it was. And this is a phone binocular photo of the palm warbler, and we're like, I guess that's just the luck you need for one of these kinds of days and years. Um, and I never saw another palm warbler. There were only a few around. Um, I'm glad I went for after that one. And, and, and it paid off. And then Joey and I decided to go up to Chatfield and hit a couple spots. He had to walk, admittedly, he had to walk probably half a mile back to his car, but I beat him to the sand spit on my bike. And we get there, and it's early May, and we picked out a black turn from like a mile and a half across the reservoir, which, you know, turns, and you're trying to like get them on your bike. They don't really stick around very long. Getting, getting a black turn early, and then we had a forcer's turn flying around as well which was just phenomenal. That was just really, really good. I mean, I, amazing. I ended up seeing a whole lot of black turns and foresters turns this year, but um, hey, you never know. And it was so awesome to get them early that year. And unfortunately, Joey had to go somewhere else, run some errands and um, like, I'll hit this little marshy spot. That's one of my favorite little patches there in the Plum or the, the Platte Delta on the west side of Chatfield. And like, I'm always looking for marsh wrens in this spot. I, I never got a marsh wren in that spot. I don't know why. I know they've got to be around. Um, when I'm walking out the little path that's sort of elevated above the cattail marsh there. Gosh, I've got a cat coming in bothering me now. Um, and I flushed an American bitter and I thought, you better perch up because no one's going to believe that I've got an American bitter. And I'll be darned if it didn't sit up. And this is a phone binocular photo and it hung out for probably five minutes perched up. I got a whole pile of photos of it. And I, one friend found it. I kind of kept that. You could really harass everything in this spot. So I kind of told a few people where it actually was and this otherwise kind of kept it vague just because um, some birds just kind of got to be careful about and I didn't want everybody going down there trying to harass and stomp through the marsh to try to get that bird and just flush it and then have it be gone. Um, but I mean, that was not really on the list of birds I expected to get this year. But I was really thrilled. There might've been a little bit of fist pumping on the bike as I was riding home after I picked that one up. I'm not gonna lie about that. So one of the big, crazy other things that I did this year, Chris Rurick lived here and he was really close with Joe Roller and, and Joe's family. 
Um, and he has since moved to Washington State, but he was coming back for about a week to visit his, his wife's family. And um, we decided to do a big day together. And I've already kind of last year in 2020, I did a big day based out of my house and I got 123 species, which is absolutely insane. I, don't, I didn't think I could ever top like 115. We just, I just totally crushed it that day. And uh, so we decided to do a big day and to try to do it as a fundraiser for the, the Roller Grant. So he reached out to his friends and family that are sort of not in the, um, the loop set we've, we've reached out to for pledges and donations. And um, we went to it on the beginning of the, on the morning of the seventh, we left my house at 3.30 in the morning. It was crazy early. And he took off on a borrowed bike with a torn saddle and uh, flat pedals and, he lives at sea level. And so he was, he was huffing and puffing. I was like, dude, you need to slow up, man. We got a long day ahead. We do not need to burn out too much energy too early in the morning. We got poor wheels. First thing, in, you know, I got a good poor wheel spot that we could ride up to. And we bird the bases of the foothills and got all, most of all those birds. And I mean, it was one of the slowest, most painful, unbirdy big days or birding days I've ever had. Like I have red breasted nuthatches in my yard daily and i missed them that day i sat in the yard for an hour after we were done i still couldn't find a way for a red breast of nut hatch we had like wild turkey was our like our big surprise score of the day the next day all kinds of stuff showed up at chatfield but that day it was not very birdie it was so i mean we had a great time it was it was just frustrating because we just couldn't find anything um here's chris and i down at platte canyon reservoir a bunch of folks met us and um brought some water and everything to try to get us help get us through the day now at one point in the afternoon dale pate one of our local birders up here said he'd meet us and he's like you need us to bring anything I'm like if you could bring us like arby sandwiches that'd be great and we sat there and just scarfed down the food like we've never eaten before um there's little things that help get you through on these really long days and we rode 65 miles this is the the route i'm going to use the strava app if i remember to turn it on um i mapped our ride and we got ended up with 105 species, which, you know, big picture is, is actually really good. We missed a lot of stuff, but we got a couple of decent birds and we raised about $4,400 for, for the Raleigh grant just from that one day, which is just phenomenal, which is phenomenal. Fast forwarding just another week to another really long, big ride. Um, many of you are probably familiar of a, a yellow crown night heron that was, gosh, east of the Arsenal refuge at First Creek, like on the far side, far east side of Denver. And it was there for a couple of weeks. I was like, man, I really should go for it. Man, I don't really know any of the roads. Like, this is a really long haul. Like, it's going to be a, you know, a full day effort to kind of get there. And I don't know where I'm going. And messaged with a couple of friends. They said they'd meet me there and bring me water. And like, we rolled up and I got it. And it was the 200th species for the big year already, but like really, really rare bird, really nice to get that. Um, and for, you know, an epic bird at number 200, we relocated a black throated gray warbler, which is really nice. I think I got common yellow throat for the year that day, which of course I got many of those later on, but you get them when you can get them, right? Um, and on my way back, I stopped at Wash Park, which is one of Joe lived near there. So we used to go there all the time. And um, some chimney swifts have been reported I didn't really have any hopes of finding them then. I figured I was going to have to kind of work pretty hard for chimney swifts. And I stood by the one pond and just kind of seeing what was around there. A ton of swallows flying around. And I eventually realized there were like five or six chimney swifts flying around and chattering over my head. And it was really kind of, kind of a special moment to know. It was like one of Joe's favorite little patches. And um, to get a really good bird there was, I mean, I got chimney swifts one other time, oddly enough, in Jefferson County, which is really hard for a bird to get in the Jeffco, um, just a couple miles west of here, really. But really nice to kind of, check that bird off and um, you know there, there's just some fun special moments like that that have happened all throughout the year no I can't even get into all of them because we just I just don't have the time to do that but um, the same day on my way heading east I stopped at a house that had a white winged dove like the day before I didn't see it and I was trying to like I didn't actually have permission so I was like standing on the side of the side of the street just kind of look checking the trees in the neighborhood and didn't see it but Doug Kibbe had one in his house down here, which is about a mile and a half from where I live, reported one from his yard that morning. And so, of course, I'm like 65 miles into my day. I'm exhausted. It's hot. I've got to get home for a meeting, which I'm clearly not going to be productive on. Uh, and like, well, I got to go. I got to go look. 
and I heard it sing a whole bunch of times. I never saw it, but I heard it sing a bunch of times. It's really distinct. Um, and then it was seen like every day for the next few weeks after that. And apparently there was a pair as well. So like ticked off a lot of really good birds. Like I've never expected to get a white winged dove or without having to work really hard to go get one. And that was, a, this was a 67 mile round trip that day. I was pretty tired, pretty, pretty tiring days. So one of the, the things I've been asked by several people, um, I don't know if this is a good thing or not, is like, what is your biggest tip? Like, what was your biggest ride that you did where you missed all your targets? Like I had one last week, but this one was still a little bit further. It was a Scarlet Tanager down in Roxborough Park um, in the neighborhood, which is basically just straight uphill. I'm telling you, it's brutal. A lot of short, steep climbs, one right after the other. And uh, Jen and Bobby Strom, it was at their house and they invited me over and they had coffee and cookies. And we watched, watched their yard for probably two and a half hours. Never saw it. They never saw it again. It was like a two-day wonder. And I really suffered. And then, of course, I stopped my Strava here, so I didn't even get my whole track. But it was a 42-mile day where I got nothing. <laughs> it was a little rough. But those, you know, you got to expect those days. And you have you have amazing days and you have some really really tough mentally physically challenging days but amazingly the next week there was a scarlet tanager in denver at a private residence and um, i emailed the home owner i was like would you mind if i come in the morning and look and listen he said it was singing a lot and a friend of mine met me there and he was he was totally cool with it and bird didn't show up for probably 15 20 minutes or standing around i'm like i hear it and my friend kathy's like you what like I hear it, it's singing like behind the house, across the street, it's singing back there. I mean, I'm an Easterner. I still have like the Eastern ear. Like I could hear that Scarlet Tanager over everything else. So we walk all the way around and, and she's like, I can't believe you heard that. And like, we picked it out and eventually flew into the yard and it was singing in the gentleman's front yard. And the neighbor came out and was like, what are you guys looking at? And it was just put on a great show. I got some audio and I got some great photos of it. And he didn't want any other visitors. So we kind of kept that one on the down low for a little while because you could really annoy a lot of neighbors very quickly. Um, wanted to respect his wishes and his privacy there, but um, allowed me to get the, the Tanager trifecta because there was a, a summer Tanager that spent like seven months over in Aurora and I got that back in February. So really sweet to get both summer and Scarlet this year. So even though you get a big dip, I made up for it at one point this year. So I know there's a lot of bird stories and there's a whole lot of just crazy Things that have happened this year and so a couple days before the 24th again i'm not sure exactly what day it was there were some couple lewis's woodpeckers sort of south of town sort of near roxborough park like south of south of chatfield and it's like my least favorite ride there's not really a good way to get there without riding on wadsworth which just is like a death wish so i ride you know i've got heavy road tires on here and so i'll ride this hard packed dirt road and through chatfield and try to take all the back roads as humanly possible and bike paths and everything which i normally do anyway um, it's just like, it's just a challenging ride. It just like mentally beats you down. I'm kind of tired of doing it. I've done it enough times this year. I'm kind of over it. So I was like, not really excited, but I was like, man, I really got to try to get these Lewis's woodpeckers. That's a really good, you know, that, that's a bird I got to target. And I'm riding out through the dirt, down this dirt road. And I flushed a redheaded woodpecker, which I managed to get a picture of from the road. And it flew up into this bush, just to the left side of the path. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. That was a redheaded woodpecker. And I stopped and like, I mean, I just like throw my stuff all over the place just strewn across the paths. Like this, nobody actually drives down this road really, um, except parks or, or state park folks. But um, I missed the photo op on that tree, but I managed to track it down and get a photo of it. Like I'm not gonna get an op to get redhead a woodpecker unless I just stumble on one and it happened. And then I got down to Lewis's woodpecker spot and a friend was meeting me. We were gonna try to find him for a second time. And I found him immediately and it was, it was fantastic. I got a really terrible photo of a Lewis's woodpecker at a great distance. We got two really good woodpeckers on the same day. Um, amazingly enough, I did find one of the Lewis's woodpecker flying up through the King Carroll Valley one morning, but um, you know, not a bird I was really expecting to get this year. So it was another like, you know, kind of like a bonus bird. But talking about bonus birds, I mean, I'd had good luck that morning. It was a very similar route that I had taken for when I'd missed the Scarlet Tanager. I decided to ride through Plum Creek at Chatfield just because it's sometimes interesting. You just never know. And like I had some time and I cruised up this little, little hill that goes up into these like sort of grassy shrubby area. And I'm like, I hear a mockingbird. I hear a mockingbird. And I saw the mockingbird. And I was like, I'm an Easterner and there are trash birds and they'd wake me up because they're singing all night long and drove me crazy. 
but I needed to get a mockingbird. We actually had one about a mile from my house up until the 22nd of December last year when it disappeared. I was like checking on that bird daily and then it was gone. It's like, man, I got to find a mockingbird. Unfortunately, I mean, I got the mockingbird. It flew before I could get a photo of it. Um, but I was cruising around. So I've already gotten three like great birds for the year already. And I'm cruising around through Plum Creek and I stopped for a bunch of sparrows. And I'm like, well, I'll look through them, you know, see what's here. Who knows? And I see a flycatcher. I see a kingbird fly behind this bunch, this suite of bushes that the sparrows were in. Like, I better check that thing. And it was a Kessens. And it ended up hanging out for a few weeks. The one had been reported in the area. I didn't really know, you know, where it was. And, you know, I didn't really have any kind of confidence of stumbling on it. And the bird was super cooperative. Again, I mean, just phone, binocular photos. And you can clearly tell it as a Cassin Kingbird. A bunch of folks got to see it over the next couple of days. And that was when I realized I had one of my favorite treats is a Three Musketeer bar. And managed to uh, stop on the dam on my way home and wolf that down. And uh, you can wolf it down in two bites, I promise you, especially when you're hungry and celebrating good birds. Like, this is just, you know, another one of these days where you like, well, I'll go to Plum Creek just for, just for giggles and see what I can find. And I found two great birds. I mean, it's just that, to build onto another, you know, just amazing day in the field. So one thing I've done a really poor job of this year is like, I've had a lot of time riding and like riding long distances, looking for birds and thinking about, you know, is the bird still there? Oh gosh, this bird's gonna be gone. I'm gonna ride like 25 miles one way and the bird's not gonna be there. That's gonna stink. I mean, how much time do I com- can I commit? I've got to get back, I've got calls. Like I made a trip to Western Wetlands in East, East Denver and I had to call at 10, a meeting at 10 and I was like five minutes late for it. And people were like, hey, where's Summer Shoe? Like, all that stuff's going through the back of your mind. Like, oh, what I gotta do for dinner? Ooh, potholes. Why is there so much glass? And you know, why is it why is the past such a disaster? Boy, I'm hungry for coffee and donuts. Like the random thoughts that go through your head while you're out there just riding bike paths, trying to make sure you're not getting lost in new neighborhoods and everything is just um, I don't know. There's a whole, there's like a whole book you could write just on the random things that blow through my mind while I'm out there. So I feel like we've only gone a couple of days since the last adventure, but this is like one of the, the last big crazy adventures of the year was of, of the spring. Of course, my road bike's in the shop. I've got my, my road wheels on my cyclocross bike. I've got rubber boots strapped to the back as Joey Kellner found a green heron the day before. And there was one up in Wheat Ridge and I'd missed that one. And I was not going to ride all the way back up there. One of my least favorite places to ride to. Um, if you get a little jaded on different places and i was like man i, I missed i was like the only day I, I the day i went was the day that bird wasn't seen it's like joey told me where he had this green hair and like i got it. he's like you need wellies take your wellies and so for some dumb reason i took a picture of me standing in my cycling gear with my binoculars and my rubber boots i started stomping around i didn't find it and joey calls and he's like i'll be there in like five minutes like oh i didn't even know you were gonna join me this is gonna be awesome so we like we meet up and we decided to split up and try to find this green hair and see if it was even still there and i didn't really have a a lot of hope because it's not that big of a spot but like maybe it'll stick not 10 seconds after we split up joey's like i got it i got the bird of course i should have gone that direction and i would have relocated it but we got it it was awesome high fives we got he got some great photos of it or just another digibin photo of it really nice bird to um, pick up for the year um and while we were there a, a friend called and it was like there was a veery that was found the day before in Chatfield. That's another really good bird. He's like, we just refound them. Like where? And so of course, Joey gets right to the spot. I'm like riding the wrong path through the woods. And we walk through this, walk the whole path. And we were like, basically have given up at this point. We turn, we're walking and, um, oh, I can't change my slide. We're turning around through the woods and I'm like, hey, there's a bird on the path. And it's the veery with a lark sparrow in the middle of the woods on the dirt path. So, I mean, the path was essentially, you know, this just little dirt path and it was walking around on the path. And Joey and I were like, you gotta be kidding me. What kind of luck is that? That we, we came up on the Viri, awesome bird. And so we split up and he had to go run errands. Like I didn't keep birding. It has been an awesome morning. I got a couple of really great birds for the year. And there'd been a little blue heron in Plum Creek Delta, um, like in the wetland somewhere because the water was high and it was, you know, been seen for a couple of days and I was messing around. I thought I had a marsh ran and my phone rings and it's Greg Goodrich. 
after the sagebrush incident, sagebrush barrow incident back in the spring, I was like, hey, give me your number. Like, you find something good. Or if I find something, I'll let you know. And like, I'm about on this marsh wren, which took me like four more months to find a marsh wren. Um, I'm like, Greg's calling. He's like, he's got to have something good. And he's like, do you need the little blue heron? I'm like, yeah. Where is, where, where are you? He's like, I'm in Plum Creek Delta. I was like, so am I. <laughs> and he was maybe half a mile away. And after like pointing and waving and we're like in different, different parts and I eventually see him and we're like trying to figure out where it was. And eventually the bird flew up out of the, out of the Creek, which we couldn't even see because there's a little berm right there with a bunch of snow egrets and it perched up and we're like, this is just, you know, dumb luck. I would have never have seen that bird. I don't know if it was seen the, the day after this or not, but um, it didn't stick around very long. That's for sure. And, um, this is just kind of the silly luck you need to be in the right place at the right time and have somebody call you with a good bird while you happen to be right there is just um, that's the kind of luck I've had for so much of this year. So a little bit of break. Of course, I'm pretty tired by um, the end of May. One of the in my my the rest of my life when I'm a uh, ornithologist with the Fish and Wildlife Service, land bird coordinator for the region, like as uh, Clark said. I got a nice little break this summer. I do, I have four breeding bird survey routes in Northeast Montana up in the prairie. And um, I, it's some of the best grasslands left in, in the United States. I have the route that has the more sprigs pipits than any other route. Basically all the other routes in the United States combined, I get more sprigs pipits on that one route. It's pretty, it's just amazing. But I also have some graduate students working on thick build long spurs. Um, we have a PhD student working on mountain plover. So I got to handle a mountain plover and um, see the whole trapping process and putting a GPS tag on the plovers. And so I get to, you know, I was gone for about 12 days of rest and relaxation of getting up at um, 2.30 or three in the morning and driving 2,500 miles across that short amount of time, trying to do surveys and spend time with graduate students in the field. Um, which is, I mean, I love it. It's like the highlight of my year getting up there every year. I just love it in the prairie. So one of the things I do, um, you know, I helped with the Birds of Conservation Concern list, which is sort of the Fish and Wildlife Service's priority species list and all kinds of information that goes into that. But it helps kind of inform where we put our resources and our time and energy um, for declining species and priority information needs and research and all that kind of stuff. And so we, we've we just had a paper come out earlier this year on just the long spurs from a previous master's project. And we've got a um, a PhD student starting at University of Georgia with a professor that replaced Bob Cooper, Clark Rushing, to work on pinion jays in Utah and northern New Mexico. Again, the Georgia small, small bird world connection. We're going to be putting GPS tags on jays all over the place and doing surveys all over the place over the next um, three or four years. And so a lot of what I do like in my day job is both facilitating projects and trying to get grants and um, fund research projects but also in like the highest priority information needs of why are these birds declining? What do we need to do to try to slow declines, turn them around? Where and how should we be doing conservation delivery on the ground to, to help make those changes and trying to connect all those dots. But even though I sit in the office most of the time, I really love like making this stuff happen and trying to help get projects going and supporting graduate students and being on the other side of the table for defenses and all of that. But, uh, I, I really enjoy doing what I get to do and working with so many diverse partners all across the West on all, on all of these birds. So a couple more milestone birds, a couple more major highlights, like Northern water thrush is my 250th species and I got it right before Labor Day. And so that was my initial goal for the year was 250. Like I've got work, I've got kids, you know, I can only chase so much. And I've, I was about to miss Northern water thrush. I just couldn't find one this year. This kind of was like epitomizes the whole year of, um, it takes a team to get these birds and you know there's so many people that I met that I either had never met before or only knew through email or through eBird or Facebook or whatever and got to know them and we got to see birds together and um and had a good time out in the field and it's kind of just this this kind of epitomizes all of that I saw photos on Facebook I think it was Colorado Field Ornithologist page crushing photos of a northern water thrush and it was a chat film was like you gotta be kidding me. I need, I still need that bird. I really, I was really, I've been working to try to find one. I hadn't been able to get one. And uh, I messaged, I commented on it and like, you know, she, the, the, the lady told me where the bird was and where she had it. And I was like, 
man, I hope it sticks around for tomorrow because I would really love to get it. And I get down there and I kind of walk across the field for like four, four minutes, four or five minutes, carrying my bike and get down to this little way. I'm like, man, I'm never going to find this thing. And I'm standing there just trying to like, just listening, looking and I hear it calling. And for, I mean, I rarely do playback, but I did a little bit of call playback for this, just of the call note. And the bird came in. I mean, I stopped it immediately. And the bird just sat there for probably five minutes. We just kind of stared at each other. And I was like, I can't believe I already hit my goal for the year of, of 250, which I thought was very doable, but, um, you know, certainly going to be a challenge. All kinds of things can go wrong. Um, it was just kind of a really special moment. And um, just, you know, the, the happy face of getting 250 early on. And what was kind of funny is, uh, you know, I texted a bunch of folks that I got the bird and are kind of like celebrating, you know, remotely and all this. And um, Joe Kellner's at, Chatfield was like, oh, I'll come find you. We'll, we'll bird and high five, et cetera. Because we was really close with Joe Roller as well. And we're out there and burning in separate places. And we never actually even crossed paths that day, um, as it turns out. But he, I'm at the sand spit and he's another spy. He's like, he calls like, I just had a Jaeger fly by. I was like, you got to be kidding me. There's no way I'm going to get a Jaeger. Like, get 251 right after I get in 250. And we searched for over an hour in different places. And we never saw the Jaeger again. It was almost certainly... Um, a long tail and it blew by and it was gone and it was like super high I'm like just so you know so excited and a little emotional about getting 250 and all this I mean it was that was a really big deal it was a huge accomplishment I was really excited about where we were and then all of a sudden like a thrill of potentially getting a Jaeger and man that let down that was rough and then I was like an extra hour like getting back trying to get to work and burning more leaf so I didn't have to burn and um, certainly quite the roller coaster and then of course a long tailed Jaeger does show up about a week and a half later and this is the time where i should have followed my instincts i had gone to cherry creek to look for shorebirds and i get to the marina and my phone's lighting up and joey's like i got a long-tailed jaeger at chatfield's like you gotta be kidding me i'm at cherry creek and so i sat there and ate some food and contemplated what to do contemplated my sanity and i turned around and i rode all the way back i made it from the marina chatfield or at cherry creek to the top of the dam at Chadfield in an hour and five minutes, which I think is, I'll never be faster than that. And I got the long-tailed Jaeger and I mean, there was a, all kinds of a debacle. I learned one thing is to, whenever Joey's going birding, wherever he's going, ditch your plans, no matter how good you think they are and just follow Joey. And then when you, he does find a rare bird, make sure you exactly ask him exactly where the bird is. Cause I was like in different places back with, oh, I got the bird from the sand spit, but I was like actually really close to the bird on the dam and um, lots of lessons learned. And I roll up and Joey goes, it's about time you got here. <laughs> Giving me slack about it all of it. Um, but we got the bird and of course, you know, I worked really hard to get that bird and busted home to get that thing and rode 51 miles. I still got home by 1030, told my wife I'd be home at 1030. I was still home at 1028. Um, and then that bird of course hung out for like 11 days I saw it a couple more times just being out birding at Chatfield and I was like ah you stinking Jaeger killing me but that's part of, that's just part of how this goes um, Clark threw a picture of a kitty wake early um, in the, in the what is it, intro slides and many of you probably are familiar that there was several uh, kitty wakes in the state um, earlier this month and I mean I went out on the first no reason it was cold it was windy it was nasty like it just kind of felt like that day where that vermilion fly catching thick build and lap one long spurs were found at Chatfield it just you go out in those crummy days cold nasty like people just don't go out on those days so I went out and I was it was miserable and I didn't really, really see much and I, I was literally up on the dam thinking to myself Chatfield dam thinking it only takes one bird to kind of like make these days worthwhile and I, I come around I was like just a ton of goals right off the sand spit not too far from shore and I pull out my binoculars and literally the first bird I put my binoculars on was nearly ring build goal size at a big black M on its back and I was like that's a kitty wake and I thought holy crap that's a kitty wake no one's gonna believe I found a kitty wake and it is howling it doesn't look like it was terrible there's a little bit of chop but it was 35 degrees and it was windy and I had my scope hidden behind a tree while I'm trying to get digibin photos of this thing. And I'm trying to text some folks that I really do have a kitty wake. I like I check my apps and kind of make sure, oh, I know it's definitely not a Bonaparte. Here's a Bonaparte. I'm not crazy. It's a kitty wake. I just haven't seen one in a long time. You know, not something I was expecting to find. I managed to get a Coburts post out and get a, a couple friends showed up and like, 
high five and they got some photos of us like I got to get out of here and I went to the bathroom at the, the campground I warmed up because it's like the only place open at this point at the, at the park because I was literally just shivering hunkered behind a tree freezing um, and then of course you know the bird stayed for um, 14, 13 days or something and it was joined with the second one I took my boys down on their birthday and they both got to see kitty wakes for their birthday not that they cared but then there were two and then there was one at Cherry Creek and then there was one up in Weld County um, pretty, there's, there were birds in Arizona and Texas as well. Um, a couple of them in Texas, actually. So beginning of a little bit of an invasion of kitty wakes and man, it was exciting. And that's what, you know, that's what it's all about. We just, it was awesome. And so many people got to see those birds and that's what it's about finding stuff or sharing birds and getting other folks on them. And, um, you know, having a good time was a life bird for a lot of people. And I mean, somebody else would have found them eventually, but I mean, it was, you know, I was tickled that I was on certainly on the kitty wake high for for a couple of days after that it was you know you don't find something awesome like that very often so current stats um, I 272 species as of today I got another bird today I've written over 2600 miles um, <laughs> I kind of put some of this stuff at the end of my most of my blog posts kind of updating and I had one ride with a frozen water bottle and the broken shifter. I've been to Chatfield 42 times. Pretty much don't ride under 20 miles when I ride the Chatfield. Um, the number of times I've had a rocker in, land on my bike, <sighs> one. And I finally got my first flat tire of the year. On Sunday, I got a snow goose for 271. And I checked my bike yesterday, knowing I was gonna go out this morning. And my rear tire was flat and I'd finally picked up a thorn. I'd, I'd gone 2,600 miles without a flat. And I, last time I had a flat was last October. I easily went 3,000 miles without a flat, which is unbelievable. And I gave a couple friends, asked me how many flats I'd had this year, like when we'd meet up to go birding. I'm like, you don't ask that question. Do not ask that question because now I'm going to have like four on the way home. So the final stretch, we got like, a month and a half left. I'm just trying to bird whenever I can. I'm burning a lot of leave trying to get out when the when the weather's bad and conditions are probably good. One thing I've learned is eat breakfast like you're going to ride 50 miles every day. If you think you're going to be able to go out for 20 miles, eat more. <laughs> um, you know, and like I've said, you know, you certainly got to chase stuff that comes up. There's just this has been one of the worst of birding years. I can ever remember. I mean, it's been abysmal. And the fact that I've gotten 272 so far with other birds possible is, is pretty amazing. I mean, it's been, it's been pretty rough. Like, I mean, we barely got a lot of species. It was, it was really just tough birding in general for warblers and flycatchers and sparrows, everything. I mean, it was just abysmal. Um, I'm hitting Chatfield and some other places of it just continuously, you just keep going out. And that's what I love. Like whether I go to my park that I can walk to or, um, go in the chat field or somewhere else, just going out, the more you go out, you find stuff. Just the more you go out. And I've, I've really shown, I found chestnut collar long spurs three times this fall. Um, two of them hung out and, or with other people have gotten to see them, the kitty wake. And we've had some incredible birds this fall already. Um, and I've also thought like, if something good shows up at like Bar Lake, I might just have to ride all the way up there and just suck it up. I'm trying to, you know, if I can get to 282 and beat Thomas Heinrich's record from last year, though, it's not, it's not apples and, uh, comparing apples to little apples and oranges, but still, I've got to I've got to have some sort of motivation, or I'm just going to be like mentally done with this. Um, but there's other there's plenty of birds that are still on the radar to get. I still need a couple scoters, red throated loon, redneck grebe. I got a Lapland long spur today at my very last stop at Chatfield after a generally pretty slow morning. There was not much around, but a few Pacific loons. And although I I stay on the edge of the South Platte Delta, and I like kind of up on a hill and there's a bunch of vegetation sort of on the edge of the water and I hear some weird noises and I hear some see some disturbance and there's some birds fighting or something I'm like this is weird and now comes a downy woodpecker with a northern shrike right on its tail and like they vanished and I don't know if that downy became lunch or what that was one of the coolest things I've ever seen and then you know at the very end I, I stopped at the last spot I just like sat there and submitted a couple of eBird checklists and I was like oh, I time to go home I got to call at one o'clock I got to get on and got plenty of time I'll walk around just just for giggles there's like coots that's about the only thing I found at off the north boat ramp at Chatfield today and then I flush a lapland long spur off the riprap just just right there I'm like you got to be kidding me I mean it's just dumb luck coming up on some birds so 
the take home is to just keep going and just keep keep looking and just to keep exploring because you'll find something cool and it certainly makes the day. So final thoughts, it's totally crazy. I've had very modest early expectations for the year. I mean, if it was ended today, it was a huge success already. Um, you know, the, the goal was not just species, but, you know, funds raised for the Roller Grant and uh, it's blown, blown my expectations out of the water. I've really come to accept that they're just birds I'm going to miss. And some of that, that ship has sailed for some now. I've picked up like cattle grid and white throated sparrow and some others that I thought I might miss. I've gotten some of those as I've gone, like just luck along the way. Um, you know, I'm just so appreciative of all the support and just messages and um, throughout the year, people telling me about birds or help me get on birds or just saying, hey man, this is awesome. Good luck, keep, it, keep up the good work, et cetera. Is really, a year is a long time to be riding your bike, chasing birds around. But, you know, as I've, as I've said, I mean, the best part of this year, is, I mean, I've had more fun birding this year than I, than I, I can ever recall. I've had amazing birding days and, and all that, but in the past, but I've had so much fun this year, meeting people that, um, that I didn't know and uh, meeting up with folks that I've known a long time and just sharing birds and experiences and having just a great time out there, even if I'm suffering on the bike. It's been absolutely a total blast. Um, and then here's, I guess it's on the last slide as well. Um, the link to making a pledge or a donation, link to my blog, um, my terrible snow goose photo for number 271. If they're riding 100 miles last week looking for birds, I got a rough legged hawk a third of a mile from my house and then the snow goose, which is about two miles from my house. My strategy did not work out very well last this last week, but um, you know, that's the way it goes. So with that, uh, I, know I ran right about an hour. I've been watching the clock here. It was really hard to tell some stories in a short amount of time is all I can say. So there's so many other good stories that I just couldn't get to.